Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. Thanks so much for joining us as we begin another program here as we uh, inform you that we're here every Saturday from 3 to 4 p.m. Pacific time. We stream live at richarddugan.com and newspress.com. We are rebroadcast on a2zen.fm. You need to check their website schedule for when the program is uh, played back. Multiple times during the week, my understanding is. We archive this program at richarddugan.com, the radio show page. So many opportunities for you to hear what we have to say here on the program, what our guests have to say. We are linked to our guests' website as well, and we encourage you to go to their websites. Um, I have made it a, a firm I take a firm stand on this. I will not reinvent the wheel. There's no reason for me to put anything more than a link to my guest's website because all the information is right there on their website. So I encourage you to go there and uh, find out more about what our guests have to say. And for those of you who have been waiting with bated breath for an Angus update, and those of you who just don't care and wish that I wouldn't say another word about him, uh, I ask you to bear with me because I think it's important. Because when you bring an animal into your home, and it's especially after the tragic loss of another animal who is a family member, uh, that's very significant. It is extremely significant. And uh, in spite of what a good friend of mine told me, she actually was rather animated about uh, and vociferous about uh, not making the connection between my pets and children, um, which I didn't make because I didn't want to upset her, but they're my children. <laughs> I'm sorry. But he's doing great, having a great time in his life, and we're having a great time in his life and uh, living in his kingdom because he is the king of the manor. He's a big boy, got to be sporting 100 pounds, uh, sleeps on the bed, pins us in, but loves it and we love him and are having a great time and you can see videos of him in his growing stages go to richarddugan.com slash dogs d-o-g-s richarddugan.com slash dogs and that is the angus update for today now let's get on to our program i encourage you again to go to our website we are linked to our guests including our guest today who has written a book called get it done it is from procrastination to creative genius in 15 minutes a day not possible. Can't happen. Sam uh, Bennett is my guest. And uh, Sam, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And before you say one word, I'm going to let our listeners know that you are a woman sitting in front of me and you just take on the first name, Sam. I'm assuming it's short for Samantha. That's correct. All right. And thank you for joining us in studio. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's nice to have uh, a guest in studio. I always love that when we, the energy is so much different and it's a lot of fun as well. I'll take Skype. I'll take a phone call. But it's always nice when, and I, and I, uh, pa- I, I won't be passing the interv- in- invitation on to you that the next time you're in Santa Barbara to come in studio because, well, guess what? You're right here. This is great. <laughs> so uh, I asked you before we got started if anybody has asked you uh, or used the phrase from Larry the Cable Guy, "Get her done, get her done," <laughs> but apparently no one's gone there. Not until generally, now. no. No, I'm sure it crosses everyone's mind, but yeah. <laughs> but what is so interesting is that this whole process. Um, of going from procrastination to creative genius only takes 15 minutes. You can do it in 15 minutes a day. And I'll say a couple of things. First of all, I think everyone's a creative genius. Okay. Everyone's a creative genius. Not everyone is artistic in the same way that not everyone is musical. Sure. But everyone has some creative genius in them. And and everyone that I've met anyway has some project that's really close to their heart that they would really like to be moving forward on, Mm -hmm. and yet somehow they're not. For all of those out there listening who have a project, something that's near and dear to their heart they're working on, raise their hand. My hand is up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, And I want you to really notice that procrastination hurts. You know, it It does. It hurts your heart. It hurts your soul. It hurts your relationships. And for many of us, it hurts our bottom line. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of tens of thousands of dollars being left on the table from opportunities you're not pursuing, the book you're not writing, the projects you're not seeing Thank you so much for reminding me of that. I somehow sensed that you had a book. (laughs) I don't know how I knew that, Richard. I just guessed. (laughs) I had a stack of papers literally a foot high. Uh Uh-huh. And it was split into several piles uh, on a shelf. And I had collated them and sorted, okay, here are all the electric bill receipts and here are all that. And I thought, you know, I got to get rid, I got to throw these away. Of course, my wife doesn't want me to just throw them in the trash because of the information that's contained. So finally got a shredder 
And I actually have completely shredded that entire stack. Well, no, I'm sorry. I put that stack into a giant bin Mm -hmm. because I was sifting through and I just tossed them in there. So now I'm taking a handful at a time and running them through the shredder. I don't even think I'm halfway through yet. But I sorted through them all. They're no longer sitting on the shelf. I've gotten the important papers out. And now here, okay, the bin to the shredder, the shredder to the garbage. See, and you have inadvertently sort of followed the steps. Um, First of all, just identifying the project and really getting in touch with your desire to get it done. Mm -hmm. And whether it's something as simple as getting through that giant pile of paper or something more intimate, more creative, more, more unique to you. Uh, I could have made origami figures with all the paper. You could have. You <laughs> could have. And we all have, um, you know, we all have a long list of stuff in the yeah. house that needs to get done. And we get everything done for everybody else. And we're busy all the time. Yeah. It's very difficult to find time to move forward on that stuff that kind of no one else cares if it happens other than you. Other than, you know, there's no quarterly even, review on yeah. how your art's going. Even to the extent of maybe wanting to pursue a different career. Not necessarily the book that you're writing, because even in my career or your career, well, you are an author, but, <laughs> but um, the, the, you know, I, I, they work their nine to five and they can write a book. But let's say, I, I, you know, someone's, I really like to pursue a music career. Yeah. But I just don't know. You know, I just don't have the time. I don't have the time. I don't know how. I don't have the money. What if it doesn't work? What I can't if I, take the criticism. What if I fail? Mm-hmm. What if I succeed? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of, of, of anxieties that will get in your way. Yeah. So this is part of why I recommend the 15-minute-a-day thing. Okay. So, so what am I doing in that 15 minutes? So here's the deal. Commit yourself. Make a decision. Commit yourself 15 minutes a day, every single day, to the projects that matter most to you. Okay. And I recommend 15 minutes a day before you check your email. Before you check your email. Before you check your email. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, spend 15 (laughs) minutes a day on those projects. And the first thing I would do is make a list of 15-minute tasks. Okay. Because some mornings you're going to wake up and be like, oh, oh, I'm bad. Oh, oh, I'm in a mood. I'm going to submit to that poetry competition. I'm going to call that agent. I'm going to, you know, you're feeling all brave and bold. Right, right. And other times you're going to wake up and feel sort of shy or broken or sad, and you're not going to want to do those bold things. You're going to want to have things on the list that will accommodate uh, a softer, quieter mood. Yeah. So that would be that would be where I would start. And you know, like I say, I recommend the morning just because that's a good time for me, and I find that the day sort of gets away from me if I don't do it first thing. But other people have other times. I tell a story in the book about my friend Emily Beck, who was at a kind of high-powered executive job and two very small boys at home. So she had no time. Mm-hmm. She wrote two award-winning plays in 20-minute increments during her lunch break every day at work. It was not her preferred way of working. I think right. if she could have chosen, she would have done it differently. But it was a way of making sure that she stayed moving forward. And she just took advantage of the time that she had. Yeah. You know, I've, I've seen, uh, because you brought up uh, the play concept, I have seen a number of movies whose concepts are so out there. I mean, it's like, wow. They, the, 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 the idea was so far outside the box. And I thought, wow, that is so cool. And in, in high school, I wrote a story called Conflagration at Sea. And I got some, I got sort of, I guess I got I rave reviews from my instructor. Mm-hmm. But I never really, I mean, I wrote the stories in school. Uh, in college, uh, junior college, which is where I went, uh, I wrote essays. Um, and it was like, I remember hearing, in this class, you'll have to write five essays. I'm like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? The first one I wrote, once I understood the process, was great. So now I'm thinking, okay, books, stories. I mean, I got all these ideas in my head. It is said, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have... Uh, I'm just going to throw in, let's say, a hundred, one hundred million dollar ideas, let's just say every day. Okay? Sure. But only a few people act on them. And then all of a sudden on, we see on TV, oh, yeah, that was my idea. I Or I had that idea too. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things I recommend for everyone, especially for creative people, is some kind of idea catcher. 
Mm -hmm. So I like index cards. Okay. I find them cheap and cheerful, easy yeah. to carry around. Whole pieces of paper intimidate me. But yeah. an index card I can manage. Carry it in your pocket. I can carry it in my pocket. Yeah. Um, also great for laundry lists or whatever. Uh, and other people have other mechanisms. They use the voice memo app on their phone or they call and leave themselves a message or use Evernote, whatever it is that works for you. Um, and it actually is one of the ways I started writing the book. When I, when I first had the idea for the book, I fell into that trap of feeling like it had to be perfect inside of my mind before I started. Oh, yeah. Right? And I yeah. wasn't sure. I was like, do I want it to be a thought for the day thing? Is it like a six-week plan? Is it this? Is it that? And I, finally I thought, okay, Sam, stop. <laughs> Let the book tell you. So I just carried around those index cards. Every time I had an idea for something I thought should be in the book, I'd write it on the index cards. And then I brought it home. I had a big manila envelope on my desk labeled genius. And I drop them in there. And after about four to six weeks of that, I tossed them out onto my dining room table and started to sort. And it was like, oh, well, here's all the stuff about how to decide which project to start on. And here's all the stuff about the emotional barriers, the inner barriers that get in your way. And here's all the stuff about budgeting and scheduling. And, you know, it was great. It had a very organic feel to it. You know, it's it's interesting because this program, we've we've dealt with uh, some interesting uh, um, uh, non-tangible aspects to, say, hoarding, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, and we've kind of categorized or identified uh, all kinds of, all different kinds of hoarding. I mean, we see the dramatic television shows of stuff from floor to ceiling and wall to wall. Mm -hmm. That's one kind of hoarding. And then there is, even on a financial level, mm -hmm. there is hoarding. You know, people, matter of fact, I don't know if you heard the news. Mm -hmm. uh, just yesterday, the latest, uh, uh, the latest list of billionaires on the planet, and it's increased by about 1,000 or 1,500, maybe 2,000 people mm -hmm. are now on that list. And Bill Gates is back at the top of that list. And even though... Many of these people give back, and he is one of them that sure. has just given and given, and it just keeps coming in. So he has the flow going. This whole process of getting it done, of not procrastinating, is part of opening up that flow, isn't it? Absolutely. The Chinese say that health is flow, right? We want the air to flow in and out of our mm -hmm. lungs. We want the food to flow in and out of our bodies, and we want money to flow in and out of our lives, yeah. right? We don't want it just to come in to keep it. We want it to flow out to the pool boy in the shoe store. Sure, exactly, <laughs> you know? exactly. Um, and yeah, and those creative ideas, you know, there's so many writers, just like you were saying about how you are, you're writing all the time, yeah. you're just not writing it down. Yeah, yeah. And once you sort of get in the habit of doing it and in the habit of getting things out there, all that stuff that feels so impossible at the beginning, you know, all those fears and anxieties that keep us stuck, all that lack of time, all that everything – it starts to sort of fall away. It's a little like starting um, any kind of physical movement campaign that really works for you. You know, it starts at the beginning. You feel like, oh, I'm going to have to go to the gym and I have to change my swimsuit and then I'm going to have to shower afterwards. It could take so much time and my hair yeah. could smell like chlorine. And, you know, and the fact of the matter is, yes, those things are true. Yeah. But the benefits of doing it yeah. start to quickly pile up and you start to go, well, sure, I have to take this time and I do smell like chlorine, but it's so fantastic yeah. for my brain, for my body, for my creative spirit. I love doing it. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Same things happen with your, with your creativity. When you get in the rhythm of, of doing it, and again, that's the benefit to the 15 minutes. The First of all, the amount of work you can get done in 15 minutes a day is shocking. And certainly 15 minutes every single day for a week a month, a year, six years. Mm -hmm. It's, And it's not just the work that gets done. It's that thing of when you set an intention and then you move your feet, mm -hmm. you actually take action, and the universe comes rushing at you. Yeah. That's when all – this is when I get emails and phone calls from my clients and students who say, I don't know, Sam, I didn't believe you, and I tried the 15-minute thing, and the next thing I know, I'm in line at the dry cleaners, and – this person's sister turns out works for so and so, and now I've got a contract. I mean, yeah, amazing, uncanny coincidences. All kinds of things start to happen because you're in it. Yeah, you're in it, and you're in the flow of it. Have you noticed that as time has gone on, and you've been doing this for a number of years, that that process seems to have accelerated for folks who have committed to doing this? Oh, sure. And you start to play a bigger and bigger game. 
Yeah. 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 And it's but I will also say that it never stops being challenging. Right. And it's one of the things that I get a little um, annoyed by when I see because I hear this. I you know, we see someone else accomplish something that we think we might like to accomplish or something that we admire. And we immediately make up a story in our mind about how it must have been easier for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Richard can have a have a talk show because he da da da. Yeah. You know, oh, Sam can write a book because she da 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 da. You know, we just cause they've got a PhD or oh they're so good looking or oh they are friends with so and so. And I'm here to tell you, it is not easier for anyone. Yeah. It is just as hard for Mister Good Looking PhD as it is for the rest of us. Isn't that kind of the worst thing that we can do though is to do do that play that p- comparison game? Oh, for sure. That I is, mean, not just because of what you've just explained. Uh, in in such good detail, but it it's 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 almost as though you almost have to take the perspective. And and I I produce a, a golf program, mm-hmm. and we've talked about this a lot. It is not a team sport; it's an individual sport. And so when you're out there playing, you just have to focus on your game, not anybody else's. I don't care if Tiger is at 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 minus fifty six. That's right. Okay. This is your game right here, right now. That's right. And especially with your creative projects, it's your voice. It's your take on the world. It's your unique point of view. It doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. Right. So, and it feels, in some ways, it feels really risky and vulnerable mm-hmm. to be creating from that space. On the other hand, it also feels like the safest place in the world. Okay, but you said something very important. You said it's your voice. Mm-hmm. And... In many instances on this program, I have heard many of my guests, maybe not quote verbatim, but at least uh, uh, spell out the principles that I am spelling out in my book that I'm working on. Yes. And I said, and I have, I've uh, this, I've had this phrase in my head. Well, there's really no reason for me to keep going forward because they've, they've, they've already said it. I have a present for you. Are you ready? I'm listening. Write this down. (laughs) <laughs> it's all been said before, but not by you. Yeah. It's all been said before, mm-hmm. but not by you. And we need to hear it from you. Mm-hmm. There's only so much wisdom in the world, and yeah. there's no trademark on it. Right. You know, I mean, <laughs> really, pretty much everybody's saying pretty much the same thing. Yeah, no matter how hard the corporate world tries to copyright and, it all. That's right. And But you also have had the experience, I'm sure, of hearing something a hundred times, and then all of a sudden, one day... You hear it in a slightly different way, or mm-hmm. you read it in a book, or you see it in a show, or on a movie, or in a song, and you think, oh, is that what they've been saying all this time? Yeah, my wife oh get my in, gets infuriated by uh, with me by that, because she's said that over and over and over again, exactly. and then I hear it over here. <laughs> I've been telling you that, Yeah, but that's what happens. <laughs> but that's what happens. And I know the same thing happens with her. That's the process. And so yeah. when you share your intimate relationship with that truth, whatever that truth is, yeah. We get to access that information in a new way. And when you're telling stories or making art about your loneliness or your joy or your creativity or your dog or yeah. your, you know, your passion for whatever, you help me with my loneliness yeah. and my passion and my confusion and my exaltation. That's what art does. It explains yeah. our feelings to us. I think James Redfield put it together best in his Celestine Prophecy books when he explained the principle of how each of us has a message for the other. Yeah. And that we do the other and ourselves a disservice by not sharing those messages and being open to the sharing of those messages. Because we're all trying to put our puzzle together of the big picture it's, as we see it. Exactly. And the world needs your art. The world needs your good work. And... Like I said, I know it's so easy to get caught up in the day-to-day of everything, but your creative work, your creative voice, only you can do it. And I hate to be the one to point out, <laughs> we're not here forever. Right. We don't have an unlimited amount of time to do our work. Right. So to, to make that 15-minute-a-day commitment and just start to experiment, see where it takes you, you know, think of it as being in beta. You know, mm. <laughs> call, yeah. it a, call it a, a dabbling if you must. But, you know, yeah. but to get yourself engaged, because as much as procrastination hurts, moving forward on your projects, even the tiniest, tiniest bit feels so great.
Yeah. I have to say that uh, whether it's that stack of paper or even uh, a making room on the shelf for the plethora of books that I have that come in um, is is uh, it is a good feeling. And, and to have accomplished something, to have moved things out so that more things can flow in. And again, it's just like the tides, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that that maybe in this period of time that we're in, and I don't know about you, but the people that I've spoken with, and I would I would agree with them in their assessment, in their observation, th- that they talk about their awareness of what 2014 is for them. Mm. There's something about this year for people that is, I mean, they're talking about not a specific event, a specific date, or anything. There's something about this year that people are saying, yeah, this is um, not a make it or break it, but this is a a make it year. Just make it. <laughs> I, I don't know where do they're it. getting this from. There's something in the air. Mm-hmm. There's something in the ethers. There's something in the electromagnetic pulse of the earth. I, I don't know, but that's what I'm. That's what I'm getting from people. It's great. It's great, and it's any time you can latch on to a wave of energy like that, and it's easier when you when you combine with other people. Yeah, I think it's great to get an accountability buddy or a coach or be in a class. You need people to cheerlead for you and who are really on your side. And let me point out to you that those people are probably not in your circle of family and friends. Mm -hmm. Your family and friends love you. Mm -hmm. They do not understand what you do or why. Mm. Yeah. And and don't ask them to. I mean, in the same way you don't understand why they go to their gig every day either. Exactly. Um, So, but find the people who are really on your side and uh, and engage with them and, and, and create whatever you know, whatever sort of contract you need to, to help each other move forward, because it's great to do it in a group. Sam Bennett's my guest. I'm Richard Dugan. This is Tell Me Your Story. Her book is Get It Done, and it's about procrastination and geniuses, the geniuses that you are, that we are collectively as well. And we're going to come back with more here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, and we encourage you to stay with us. Oh, come on and walk. Welcome back to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, along with uh, Sam Bennett, and uh, she has written a book called Get It Done. The subtitle is From Procrastination to Creative Genius in 15 Minutes. And my next question, I think, is a fair question. Okay. Uh, When did you realize you were a procrastinator? (laughs) It's not so much that I was realizing that I was a procrastinator. It's more that I realized that the people I was working with were procrastinators and not even so much procrastinators as overwhelmed by choices. You know, when you can do anything, and like I said, when there's no quarterly review about how your one-person show is going, um, it can be very difficult to move forward. And, you know, my background's in theater. I grew up as an actor. I still work as an actor and a writer and a teacher. And so I always had a billion part-time jobs and gigs mm. and projects. And my income would go up and down and my schedule would go up and down. It was completely peripatetic and unpredictable. And I got really interested in the question of, well, how do we as creative people stay on course? How do we make a decision? How do we pick which of our 137 ideas is the good one? Yeah. How do we stay motivated, particularly in that middle part, you know, the groan zone when you feel like nothing's ever going to work out or towards the end where it's looking like it might actually be real and that can get really scary. And I kept reading books trying to find the one I wrote ultimately. You know, there's all these business books out there that are great about time management and productivity. But, you know, creative people don't really care who's moved their cheese. Yeah, And then there's all the creativity books out there, many of which are wonderful, but a lot of them are about spiritual healing through creativity or unleashing your inner artist. And for those of us whose inner artist is already plenty outer, thank you very much, (laughs) you know, how do we do it? How do we do it? So that was really the the source for me. And what happened is is that there isn't a the way. This is yeah. what I realized. There's not like it's not like I've got some incredible master plan and everybody should do things my way. Right. But I've got some incredible exercises and questions and inquiries and games inside the book to help you figure out what your incredible way is. Cuz the only way for you to get your work out there is your way. You know, I read the book Who Moved the Cheese. 
it was made mandatory by my boss back at the Christian radio station I was working for. Mm -hmm. After reading it, I, I, and I say this to this day, I don't have a problem with the cheese being moved. Just tell me that you're moving the cheese. That's all I ask. A little communication goes a long way. Go ahead and move it. (laughs) You can move it to Alaska or to the Antarctic. I don't care. Just let me know. Right. That's all I ask. Yeah. I can can handle the change. I can handle rearranging the furniture. Or I want to put the bookcase over here. Or I want to try this job in San Francisco or New York or off an island, wherever. Just let me know that that's what's happening. That's all I ask. Yes. Clear, concise communication could save this country millions. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 you know, we talk about change and how change is the only constant in the universe, and yet we handle it so poorly as human beings. Um, and And yet it's like I can accept change. Granted, you don't always know when it's going to happen, Mm -hmm. but you know that it's going to. And I found an an interesting clue in my own life. When things, it's like when the dust starts to settle, when things start to become very calm, almost mundane. And I can honestly tell you that in the last uh, eight years that I have lived in Santa Barbara, it's been anything but Mm -hmm. mundane or calm, which is good. Mm -hmm. It says I'm doing the right things. I'm in the right place at the right time. But I noticed back when I was in Phoenix, just before my job changes would take place, things became very, very soft, very slow, Mm -hmm. very simple and easy and and routine, which was okay. But that was the clue. Yeah. Okay, something's coming. You know, I think a lot about um, creative dichotomies, about things that are true at the same time. I like that word, too. Yeah. And how... You know, we get a little trapped because we think that things have to be one way or the other. You know, on the one hand, we really want things to stay the same and be comfortable and be familiar and be Mm -hmm, safe. mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we really want things to be exciting and new and different and challenging. And we want both of these things at the same time. So I think the key to a happy life is is managing the, the energy between these two things, surfing the energy between these two things. I always think of those magnetic pigs that we had as kids, right? Oh, yeah. They repel each other and then you flip them around and they, they click together. Click together, yeah. Right. So if you imagine those two ideas sort of both attracting and repelling at the same time and that, that creative tension between those things. Yeah. And there's a lot of those. There's also, uh, you know, on the one hand, especially as a creative entrepreneur, you really want to pay attention to the marketplace. You know, you really need to know what's out there. You need to know what other people are charging. You need to pay attention to what's going on. On the other hand, you should never take advice from anyone, least of all the marketplace, and you should absolutely not pay any attention to what anybody else is charging or doing because it has nothing to do with what you're doing. Right. Both of these things are true at the same time. Yeah. So that's really where the excitement is, is from navigating those two things. And sometimes internally, I think sometimes one of the things that keeps creative people stuck is that feeling of like, well, on the one hand, I'm pretty gregarious and kind of fun at parties. On the other hand, I'm kind of a loner. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're a gregarious loner. You are both of those things at the same time. You don't have to be one or the other. You get to be both. It's interesting uh, because it reminds me of um, uh, a question that was asked of somebody who had just come back from a, a vacation trip. And uh, they took the family, the kids, the whole thing. It went to Disneyland, let's just say. So how was your trip? Oh, it was great. Well, he's only telling half the truth mm-hmm. because there were problems with the kids and so on and so on and so on. So you've got both things. It was good and it wasn't good That's right. at the same time. Yeah. Um, with that dualism that, that, that uh, frustrates me because I'm trying to understand why it is that we're in this world dealing with the dualism when we came from the one, we're going to the one. I mean, that's it's that whole metaphysical thing. And it's like, what the heck? I'm getting a better handle on it. I'm beginning to understand it better, even though I've been studying this for, for years. Um, but I guess it again, it's and I, this also brings up a conversation my brother and I had. We were walking in the desert. Uh, there was a family reunion at a, a place in uh, southern Arizona where my uh, uh, grandparents lived and so forth. And we're just walking and we were chatting and I shared some insights uh, and some wisdom that I had come across and to which my brother said, well, it's about time you got it. And I turned to him and I said, no, it's not about when you get it. It's about that you get it. 
and that you get it over and over and over and over. And, and you over probably again. will. Yeah. 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 It's not, it would be wonderful if we all just like sort of achieved enlightenment and then stayed there. Yeah. But you don't. And, and one of the things with the creative process too, you know, you, like you said, you're, you're making your way up the mountain all by yourself. You know, there's no big trail for the creative person. You've got to do it yourself. You're using your own intuition as a compass and right. your skill sets as much as you have them. Hopefully you've got some kind of a trail guide, you know, a friend or a coach or an accountability buddy. Yeah. And there will come points when you get to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And those are great moments. And then you do top of the mountain things. Yes. Like take pictures. Yes. And celebrate. Yeah. And sign the guest book. And, you know. But you, and then you keep walking. Yeah. But you've opened up th th that, again, sort of dichotomy of um, the fact that it's your voice, it's your story, it's your idea, it's your creative, intuitive self that must do these things. Mm -hmm. For you to feel satisfied inside. At the same time, we never do it. It's never a solo um, uh, climb. Right. Because th for where I am today, I didn't get here by myself. Of course not. I had help from every corner of the workplace th that I was in that I can mention. I mean, I can go down a list of names of people who have contributed to my success and where I am, both in the business place as well as in relationships, so the family and so forth. And it's real interesting when I start hearing these kinds of phrases, say, coming from the news. Mm. You know, people say, I built this company. Yeah. I made the, and it's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't do it by yourself. Yeah. All right. You may have had the vision. And that's something else, too, is, the, is, is vision. Yeah. When Steve Jobs passed, the first thought that went through my mind was Apple is never going to be the same again because the man with the vision is not at the helm anymore. Mm -hmm. And nobody else has his vision because it was Steve's. Just like you said earlier, it's your voice. It was his voice behind Apple. Right. And now it's new people. So... This process of bringing out this this creative genius within ourselves, one of the steps is we've got to acknowledge that that person is within us. Absolutely, that desire, that the fact that you've had this idea, yeah. you know, is is and that it's stuck around for as long as it has, right, is great news. You know, I say in the book that procrastination is genius in disguise because mm -hmm. it's actually your genius. If you imagine this idea sort of as a you know pulling on your sleeve, going, hey. Hey, didn't you want to make me a little short film? Hey, didn't yeah. you want to, you know, yeah. clean out the garage? Hey, didn't you want to? And and you remember the and the, the persistence of this idea, the fact that you feel bad about not having moved forward on it is actually great news. Mm -hmm. Because that desire, that's your engraved invitation from God. You know, yeah. you're not getting any more um information than that, really. Right. That's how we all start is just with that feeling of like I kind of think I want to Whatever that is. And so to start taking steps and move forward on that and really acknowledge that the fact that you haven't done it up to now is, is okay. There's a real evidence of the strength of your desire there. And yeah. to really surf that energy forward is great. There's an element of – I mean you, you – you, I would think that you'd want to try, in spite of how bad you might feel at procrastinating, you might want to maybe feel good that at least you haven't shunned the idea. Well, it hasn't shunned you. And, and it hasn't shunned it you. It won't let go of you either. Right. Because let's face it, you've had a ton of other ideas that have kind of come and gone, right? Yeah, exactly. But these, exactly. But this one, these one or two, they're still around you. And that's great news. It yeah. really it means that it's time for you to experiment with them. Do you think, too, that there is an element of timing in the whole process as well absolutely um when my wife and i moved here in 2006 to santa barbara um i tell this i tell the story about how we waited for both of our jobs to disappear my job went away because the radio station was sold to somebody else who was changing the format and letting everybody go and her job she quit because of a hostile work environment and um, she says, this is the second time in my life where the words were coming out of my mouth before I knew what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's how we wound up here. But it also dawned on me, well, why did we have to wait 
for our jobs to disappear. Mm -hmm. But then I go to the question of timing. Yeah, this is another one of those creative dichotomies. On the one hand, you should you should absolutely set your own timeline. You need to make your decisions, set your goals, set the calendar, move your feet, and make it happen. And don't accept any excuse otherwise. On the other hand, projects have their own time. And you kind of have to surrender to that. And sometimes it hasn't been the right time because of life circumstances. You know, there's been a financial crisis or a health crisis or a new baby in the house. Sometimes it hasn't been the right time because of technology. Hmm. You know, I mean, we couldn't have a Skype interview 10 years ago. Right. The technology wasn't there. Wasn't there, yeah. Um, you know, we couldn't have hosted this on online. There, there, It just wasn't there. Wasn't there. So sometimes you're waiting yeah. for, for things to unfold or for the right partner to, to appear. Um, and there's no, I don't know that there's really a way. I had somebody ask me recently, like, how do you tell the difference between the sort of natural trepidation that someone feels when you're about to start something new and that real gut feeling that this is not the right thing for me or this isn't the right time? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I don't know that you can. Those feelings are so close to each other. They're so right next to each other that I think you can only tell once you actually start moving. So this is why I say try the 15 minute a day, move your feet a little bit and see what happens. It may be that you start moving and sure enough, the right partner shows up and sure enough, the technology is right there. And sure enough, you know, things open up for you. It may also happen that you start to move and it's a lot of miscommunication and knees and elbows and bad phone calls. And you think, you know what, this is not the right time for this. Yeah. You know, so uh, but the fact, again, that you keep showing up to the idea and the idea keeps showing up to you, that's great news. Yeah. That's great news. I remember uh, thinking about that. Um, I had to wait 36 years for uh, technology to catch up to me in order to get a lens implant. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I knew, I was driving through L.A. freeways. Never really I, – I had actually gotten to the point the year prior where I said, hey, Okay, this is life. I'll I'll be bicycling the rest of my life. I mean, it's okay. Yeah, it's fine. I, I've got no problem with that. Uh, I'm doing great right now, and it's going to keep me healthy, and I'm going to be doing well in that regard. So let's just keep doing this. This is fine. And then the next thing I know, turn around the following year, and boom, and I'm going after my driver's license. And like, really? How did this all happen? You know, kind of thing. Well, and that's it. We don't always know how the story is going to go. Yeah. You know, we keep ourselves stuck because we have, we start to use our imaginative powers not for good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we start to imagine, well, you know, no one ever sells a first novel or, you know, all the good ones are taken or, yeah. oh, it'll never work or that yeah. technology is going to never come around or nobody's ever going to pay for this or want that. Like, you know what? You actually don't know that. Yeah. You don't. don't know that. I, I remember my ophthalmologist telling me, um, he said uh, when we were discussing the surgery, he says uh, that there is a 50-50 chance. You know, you're dealing with, you know, invasive procedure. And I said, well, then let's do it now so I can start adjusting if I was to lose my sight. Right. And uh, unfortunately, it went the other way. But that's that to me is fascinating because <laughs> I listened over the course of the last six years to the financial news mm -hmm. and they kept talking about how they were in uncharted territory. They did not know what to do in this certain circumstance. And yet they were applying the same old bandages mm -hmm. to that, which they didn't know anything about mm -hmm. to try to fix it. And I thought, wait a minute, even before 2008, you guys didn't know what the future was. That's why they call them speculators. Right. And you're in no, you're, you're still in the same boat here in this period of six years. You still don't know what's going to happen, but you seem to think that these are the solutions. It's like, that isn't even logical thought. Well, but people do it all the time, right? We keep applying the same old solutions that never worked to begin with right. to the new problems that we have, and then we wonder why our life doesn't change. <laughs> Isn't that Einstein's uh, de definition of insanity? It's right up there, yep. Same yeah. thing over and over same again. Same kind of thing. And and one of the things I want to toss out for, for people to chew on a little bit, because one of the things that gets us stuck is this perfectionism thing, right? Like we think yeah. we've got to come up with the right answer yeah. or the perfect answer or yeah. the perfect solution. and. Here's what I'll suggest. Get a C. Okay. Just get a C. Quit trying to get an A+. Plus. Just get a C. Mm -hmm. C is the grade that you get for showing up 
and doing the work. Mm -hmm. Show up, do the work. Not doing the work better than anybody else, not doing any extra credit work, not Mm -hmm. doing nothing fancy, just show up, do the work. And I know all the little apple polishers out there, you know, like breaking out in hives. I was one of them. I get it. But here's the thing. Your version of a C is probably everybody else's version of an A. Yeah. And if for some reason you get it out there and it really does need to be made more perfect later, then you'll make it more perfect later. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll release version 2.0, director's cut. Right. You know, it's not that big a deal to fix things once they're out there. But that's different from, (laughs) and I have to use this example, Nancy Pelosi telling us that if this bill doesn't work, don't worry, pass it and we'll fix it later. That's not the same thing. In my opinion, that's not the. If you know it's broken already, you don't want to put it on the highway. Right. I I would really be hesitant to compare anything that happens in Washington to an individual's <laughs> creative process. <laughs> um. All right. Well, th- then we'll go to the car analogy. If if the vehicle isn't working properly, you don't want to put it out on the road. Right. Because you're putting yourself and others in danger. Again, that is different than going for a C. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a, but and a if lot you've of people got, still do that. Sure. And if you've got good evidence that, that you know, that something's broken or, or dangerous or not going to work, then yeah, you know. Step away from step it. Step away from it. Absolutely. Yeah. But what I see more and more is people saying, well, I don't want to get in the car because it might be broken somewhere down the road. <laughs> yes, it might. You know, like, well, what if I do this thing and then it's really successful and then my accountant embezzles from me and then I end up with the waitressing job that I had back in college? What about that? Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, let's just, again, let's go back to the 15 minutes a day. <laughs> yeah. Let's just start. Start little pieces. And follow the sparkly breadcrumbs and see where it leads yeah. you. I, I guess, too, the other thing is, is if I look back, I could not have imagined back... 35 years ago, when I first started in this industry, that 35 years later, I would be here. Yeah. It was not even remotely in my, in my mind's eye. And it's, like I say, you got to follow the sparkly breadcrumbs. I had a client yeah. named Leslie who was a jewelry designer who had been really stuck. And uh, I love my, my private clients because they pay me so much they have to do what I say. <laughs> and um, so she was very reluctant to try the 15 minute a day thing, but she had to because I was bossing her around. And she ended up because she was like, you know, Sam, it takes me 15 minutes just to get my stuff out. Like, this is never going to work. And yeah. I'm like, just you're a creative genius. Figure it out. Try it. She ended up creating sort of a little tray for herself so she could actually sort of have her stuff out. And she could just pull it off the shelf and do 15 minutes of work and then put it back. Great. In a week, she finished three necklaces, which was three more than she had finished in the previous three months. Now she's got this little tray and she figures out that she can take it to her other gig, which was she was apprenticing at a tattoo parlor because she wanted to be a tattoo artist. Oh, wow. So she starts to bring her jewelry stuff there for the downtime, you know. Well, they had no idea she made jewelry. They'd fall totally in love with her jewelry. Now she's selling her jewelry at the tattoo parlor <laughs> and making enough money between tattooing and jewelry that she could quit her cubicle job. Here, here. 15 minutes a day, I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. Amazing things happen. Yeah. Um, it, it is, it seems so simple. And maybe it really is. But our minds... For whatever reason, we want to have some complicated multi-step process to get through these various challenges, whether it's procrastinating on on an, uh, an idea that we have or a project that we want to finish or just do. Um, and so we, just, we, you know, we come up with all these things. And then, of course, then we go out and find try to find all these different books, uh, the seven steps to this, the five steps to that, the three steps to this, the 40 steps to that. Yeah. And it just takes one. Well, it takes one and it takes a million. I mean, it's the sure. great news is that, um, you know, the people who buy these kinds of books, people like you and me, we're, we're in a state of continuous improvement. Mm-hmm. We're lifelong learners. We can't yeah. get enough of this stuff. You know, we'll read it and hear it over and over and over again. And, and that's beautiful. You know, I mean, musicians never stop learning about music. Um, you know, theologians never stop learning about 
the study of religion. Right. There's no there's no point at which you go, oh yeah, I got it now. Mm-hmm. I got it dialed. That's it. You know, and you know, the mind is a tricky, tricky thing. You need as yeah. many tools in your toolkit as you can get oh, because yeah. Yeah. you will self sabotage, you will deflect, you will de- self destruct. You know, you need as many tools as you can get. And I know it feels like you're doing the same thing over and over again, like you're learning the same lessons over and over yeah, again. Yeah. But I think of it um I think of it one of two ways. I think of it as a gyre, you know, that's how hawks fly, right? In a mm-hmm. in an ever increasing in a circle spiral. Get, in yeah. a spiral that gets higher and wider every time. So yeah, you're still going in circles, but it's at a different altitude and with a different uh breadth than ever mm-hmm. before. The you other also- analogy is my sister used to do gymnastics when she was a little girl and she, we were talking about this one time, and she said, yeah, it's like, you know, when I was little and I learned to do a somersault, and that was a big deal, and then you learn to do it backwards, and then you learn to do it on the balance beam, and that's a whole other thing, and then yeah. you learn to do it in the air, and then you learn to do it on the uneven bars, and it's all still somersaulting, yeah. but at increasing degrees of sophistication and speed. Right, right. I, you know, it's it's. Um, I was thinking, too, about how when... When the 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 uh, emergencies come up in mm-hmm. radio, mm-hmm. it used to be that I would get real flustered. Mm. And even though I knew how to operate things, there was that real uneasy feeling. Sure. And it wasn't always if there was an emergency. It was more if something didn't work properly. And again, I'm still... Flum, fluttering around trying to fix it. No, no, I would just start doing stuff thinking, okay, I will eventually hit the right comma. It's kind of like a hundred <laughs> monkeys in the room with typewriters. Eventually right. they will spit out Something Shakespeare's Hamlet. <laughs> yeah. And what I have come to learn is that that doesn't happen anymore. I know where everything is right. and I, I have reached a level, I guess, of confidence because I've been doing it for so long. That as long as I know where my tools are, right. that I can I can go ahead and handle anything. And it may not always sound perfectly smooth. That's okay. Yeah. And what you're getting at here is another thing that I think really stops people in their tracks, which is, I don't know how. Yes. I want to do this thing, but I don't know how. Yeah. I don't know how. I don't know how to do this. It's like, well, sweetheart, of course you don't know how. How could you possibly know how? If you knew how, you would have done it already. You would have done it already. You know, everything's hard when you don't know how to do it. So, you know, the how is part of the invitation. The how is part of the challenge. You start to experiment with how. You start to figure out how. Well, how does a person do that? You start, you know, and uh, we're partly, I think, because we're hunter-gatherers, you know, yeah. we're, we're very dismissive of our own skill sets. Like the minute we know how to do something, we're like, oh, yeah, that's easy. It's like, well, it wasn't easy when you didn't know how to do it. No, no. You know, it wasn't easy the first time, but now later you do. And we but we get stuck in that in that mindset that says, well, if I don't know how, I better not even try. Yeah. Or I, I'll throw another one at you. Same concept, a little twist on it. I love these. Um, uh, I'm always looking for patterns and things. Mm. And I was reading this one book years ago. And I got to the place in the book where it talked about uh, you have to find the pattern in these characters. And um, so I went through the first set of characters and it was um, I'm just going to throw out some of the characters like uh, one, three, four, six, seven, nine. And you had to figure out, OK, well, what's the pattern? And of course, first I tried doing the math. OK, mm-hmm. what's the separation point and so forth and so on? Well, the long and the short is it was straight lines, curved, straight lines, mm-hmm. curved. OK, I went to the next set and it was A, C. E, O, L, J, and so forth. Mm-hmm. And I sat there for 20 minutes trying to figure out what the solution was. It was the same, same as, as for before. the previous equation. Yeah. I had thrown out. I, was, I got that one, so I'm throwing that one out. I'm right. never going to need that again. <laughs> uh, and I think that we kind of tend to do that too, where we don't, it's like, you know, it's not that we want to keep, doing repetitive things but sometimes there is a solution that will work a couple of three or four times sure sure and you know i one of the many gigs i've had in my life of a million gigs uh is helping people with meeting facilitation and consensus one of the rules of consensus is when you don't know what to do Mm -hmm. go with the last decision you made okay right so uh 
if I'm trying to decide what new car to buy, you know, well, in the until I make a new decision, until, until I have enough information to make a new decision, I'm going to stick with the last decision I made, which was the car I already have. Right. Right. Um, and that's not a bad that's not a bad rule of thumb when you get a little when you get a little stuck. You know, well, I'm not sure. Should I you know, should I go? Should I not go? Should I go? Should I go? Well, the last decision I made was that I would go. Right. I said I would go, so I'm just going to go with that one until I get enough information to make another decision. Right. And that's still in keeping with uh, even one's uh, own intuition because sure. we've talked, I mean, my goodness, we've spent hours talking about intuition. We refer to it by so many different terms, the higher self, uh, the still small voice and mm-hmm. so forth. And I've often said that it will never hurt you. It, it, it will never, ever, ever, ever lead you astray. It may challenge you. OK, it may put you in situations uh, if you choose to go in the direction that it's prompting, uh, you know, and I've given examples of, of not following the prompting and it won't go away. And I literally I kid you not, I literally have to go back a mile mm-hmm. and make the turn that I was instructed to make just so that it would go. Up. I don't know why it was asking me to do this, yeah. but I want it to go away because it's driving me crazy. <laughs> One of the other things I recommend in the book, actually, is if you're, you know, if you're really into it, the 15 minutes a day on your project is great. And then I like to throw in an additional 15 minutes a day mm-hmm. cultivating your intuition. Okay. And I recommend some kind of simple repetitive action. Going for a walk is great. Swimming is great. Mm-hmm. Something non-narrative. So okay. no books, no music, no games, no, you know, no toys, nothing that beeps or whistles. Um, but you know how you have those great ideas in the shower? Yeah. Right. We want to cultivate that. Yeah. Right. So to give yourself some deliberate, empty brain space, some 15 minutes of daydreaming, of wandering. um, I think it's amazing how, you know, your brain is so good at finding what it's looking for. It's this amazing machine. You ask it a question, it will deliver you an answer almost every time. Yeah. But sometimes you got to shut up long enough for it to do it. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, you're in the shower, you're getting a massage and all of a sudden your brain's going, oh. Good, she's quiet. Okay, here's what you should do about the blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> here's the answer to that thing you were wondering about. It's like, oh, thank you. Well, so, yeah, I'm a big fan of cultivating that intuition and that, that deep intuitive knowing. I think that, that as we are, are talking here today, and again, to, to let our listeners know who are just joining us or who have, even if you've been with us the whole, whole time, Get It Done is the title of the book. Sam Bennett is our guest. It has to do with procrastination and cultivating that creative genius that's inside of you that only takes... 15 minutes. I am so intrigued by this concept only because it allows us to do it in bite-sized pieces. I mean, 15 minutes is not a grievous thing. I remember um, uh, being taught how to meditate, for example, or being Mm -hmm. told, okay, here's the process that you want to go through. And um, the first thing they said was start with a minute. Yeah. Just start with a minute and see how that goes. And then maybe double that uh, and then maybe add another minute and so on and so on. And then as you can. And I've even found that if I can find the right uh, pacing and location for the walk, which I love here, I can literally I can walk to the beach in 20 minutes Mm -hmm. from here. Um, for me, that is a, a form of meditation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, yeah, those small increments, and it's funny because we trick ourselves, you know, again, our, our, you know, on the one hand, we sort of get that, you know, even a minute a day or 15 minutes a day would really make a big difference. But we sort of have that like, well, that wouldn't work for me. You know, like I get it that if I practice guitar for 15 minutes a day yeah. or if I work on my novel for 15 minutes a day that I would see progress, but it's not going to work for me or my project. And I just want to just try it. And, you know, set your timer on the phone, set your kitchen timer, um, put a sign on it to remind you why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm doing it to escape the cubicle. I'm doing it for freedom of expression. I'm doing it for truth. I'm doing it for joy. I'm doing it because I want to, (laughs) because I have the desire to, Right. whatever that is. And and sometimes, and again, this is the great thing about the everyday strategy, is sometimes you're going to sit there and just stare at it for 15 minutes. Other times you're going to sit down for 15 minutes and get up five hours later. Yeah, that was the thing I was going to ask you. Um, um, should we set a timer or just let the time be? I really recommend a timer, and particularly my friends who have um, attention disorders tell me that the timer is super helpful for them to mm-hmm. help them sort of narrow in and focus. Um, 
I sometimes say that I have attention surplus disorder, paying a little too much attention to a few too many things a little too much of the time. <laughs> Not to make light of anyone's disorder, but um, right. yeah, no, I I like the timer thing myself, especially if you're just getting going. But you know, if you hate it, don't use it. I mean, again, this is about you finding the way that works for you. With the plethora of things that you have done over your uh, time, uh, how many of them, just by percentage or what have you, uh, were things that you you say had to do for, say, survival Mm -hmm. versus that you wanted to do that would help you with your survival, but your survival wasn't contingent upon them? Tell me more about the question you're asking. I'm not sure. Well, you're an actress. Yeah, I am. Okay. But that doesn't help you with your survival unless you're really good at it and you're bringing in some good, good income in that regard. Then it is. But... It's not that it's your survival is no longer of a concern because you're into the acting thing. Yeah. I mean, to me, acting was always an important part of my survival. OK. Um, I don't know that I would have made it through childhood or certainly adolescence without without acting. OK. So um, and the and the degree to which it and it always figured into my financial life. I mean, I always made a living as an actor. Um, I was really lucky that way. I had to supplement it with other things, but I was never, it was never not part of my financial picture. So it was actually a have to, want to. It was a have to, want to. And, um, you know, an interesting thing happened when I, uh, you know, I was living in Los Angeles. I was getting some work as an actor and, but still had to have these other gigs. And sometimes I was just miserable. I mean, I, I, there was one job in particular, there's nothing wrong with the job, but I would have to leave early to have time to pull over to the side of the road and cry because I was so unhappy. Mm. And part of the reason I had been making myself unhappy was because I had only been focusing on acting. I felt like only acting mattered. The part of me that was a writer, the part of me that liked to cook, the part of me that could, uh, you know, had all these other creative skills and talents, those things didn't matter. Only acting mattered. Mm. And I was keeping myself in this sort of prison of desire around that. And the minute I sort of opened that up and said, you know what? The part of me that's an actor is the same as the part of me that's a teacher, is the same as the writer, is the same as the girl who likes to needlepoint, is the same as the girl who likes to cook. This is all part of my creative spirit. My entire life gets to be an art project. My business is an art project. My business is also an expression of my spiritual practice. It's not separate from that. Mm -hmm. Nothing is separate from that. And that was when... Well, that's when my income tripled, <laughs> and that's when I really started to see some some serious movement. Yeah. Have you ever had a role that you were so captivated by that maybe, like as a child, I used to, you know, play superheroes, you know, that you didn't want to come out of or that you would – just prefer to stay there because it was just so much fun, whatever it was, even if it was a, a villain for that matter. Sure, sure. I've done a, I've done a number of shows like that. There was a, a, a play that I did. It was the world premiere, and I actually um, – so I originated the role. And it was fun because the part was originally written for a man. But because they cast me, mm-hmm. that part is now forevermore a woman's role. So – Yay. Cool. Yay, team. Um, (laughs) But it was a beautiful – the whole experience of putting on that show, it was challenging. uh, But the whole – the world of the show was very beautiful. It was was kind of its own little bubble. Mm -hmm. And I loved the part. I had a a, – it was a great part. And – yeah, there's definitely some some melancholy in leaving those those times behind. But the thing about theater is it happens – through time, I was doing a workshop with my friend Shiloh Sophia, who's a painter and a painting instructor. And she was talking about painting. And she said, you know, painting in the context of this workshop anyway, is about capturing an emotional moment in time. Hmm. That's what she was going for. Okay. And I said, oh, that's so interesting because in my main art form in theater, emo- you know, it comes and it happens through time. It comes and then it disappears forever. And she looked stricken. She was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, and it never occurred to me to capture a moment in time like that. Mm. That, That's not what theater is for. Theater happens through time. So you sort of, while it is kind of sad, you also sort of get used to it. Yeah. You 
It's uh, it's it's like um, uh, a book that we uh, I've I've read. I, I don't know how many books I've read, but there have been some books that I I have to go back and reread. Oh yeah, because I enjoyed them so much. I mean, there's one book that if I was still using audio tape, I would have worn it out by mm-hmm. now because I have listened to it so many times. And this is what I mean when I say the world needs your art. You know, those plays that we saw, that music, that song from that one summer, that book that you go back to over and over again, that movie, you know, that horrible night in your life. And that stupid movie came on and healed you. Yeah. It healed you. How dare it? How dare it? You were miserable and it healed you. <laughs> you know, that's that's what art does yeah. for us. It has done, you know, art has done that for you. And let me point out, not always great art. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's the stupid song. Yeah. And the dumb book and the embarrassing movie. But it's still, it reached out and it healed you. And you now get to pay that forward. Yeah. Your creative voice, your gifts. You came this way. These are your gifts. What do we do with gifts? We give them. Yeah. It is your opportunity to do that for someone else. And so you keeping it all to yourself like that, well, that's just mean. <laughs> <laughs> How dare I? Get it out. Uh, get absolutely. It <laughs> get it done, get it done, get it done. Before we wrap up our program, I, I, I and it's interesting because with this interview, I'm actually going to modify one of the three questions. Um and that's assuming that I will remember the third question, but I can ask the first two anyway. Who is Sam Bennett? Uh, well, in the sense, I'm not, sorry, in what context? Whatever context your intuition uh, has you respond. Uh, well, the two thoughts I had sort of simultaneously was Sam Bennett, child of God, uh, and the other was Sam Bennett, author. There's sort of this new Sam Bennett out in the world who's a, who's a published author. Mm-hmm. What is it that you hope to or want to achieve through the work that you're doing now? I would like to see an international revolution of creative people claiming at least 15 minutes a day on their projects. I would like to have that be as much a part of the vernacular as eating your greens and going for a walk and drinking eight glasses of water a day and getting eight hours of sleep. I think it's as essential to our survival as that is. I would love it if on, uh, I don't really watch daytime television, but I feel like on those talk shows, like they've got their medical expert and their oh, yeah. home decor expert. And I would like there to be a creativity expert. Mm-hmm. I would like that to be just a part of the conversation. I think that would be excellent just simply because we are – it seems like in our educational system we're drifting further and further away from that. It's disastrous. And I've I've said on more than one occasion, <clears throat> if I say if you're going to cut courses in school, cut the basics. For because real. you're going to learn, for example, you keep music, you keep a band, you keep choir, because in those courses you are going to have to learn some basic math. Learning two, four time, four, four time, three quarter time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Eighth note, sixteenth note, dot, 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 dot. You're going to have to learn other languages, especially in certain choral arrangements. I was mm-hmm. in madrigals in high school and we learned some <clears throat> Italian and some German and so forth, mm-hmm. including the English in terms of grammar. You're going to learn those in terms of the words and the songs. And you, but you, and you learned all the intangible things. You, I mean, again, you in theater. Again, you learn history. You learn English. You learn, but you also learn how to listen. Yeah. And how to be present. You learn how to move your body. You learn what the true meaning of team is. Yeah. I have a friend that I know from from theater, from the LA theater scene, but he then went on to a very illustrious career at Apple. Actually, we were talking about Apple. Mm-hmm. Or earlier. Uh, And he said that he can now, when he's interviewing people, he can tell who has a background in the arts and who doesn't. Because he says, the kids who have a background in the arts, he says, they're in automatically because they get it. Yeah. They get it. They under they're up out of themselves. They have a broader sense of what's going on. They understand give and take. They understand, like I said, teamwork. They understand commitment. They understand project. They understand, you know, the, the world in a whole different way. And he said it, he said he would make it mandatory. Three years in the theater for everyone, like the Israeli army. Like you just have to go and work <laughs> in the theater. I thought it was a great idea. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to carry guns. That's right. Tell us, the uh, what is your website? Uh, the website is theorganizedartistcompany.com. Theorganizedartistcompany.com. All the way spelled out because I'm a spell it all out for you kind of a girl. 
but you can also hop on my mailing list and get a free special treat. Mm-hmm. Uh, the treat is a book that I wrote called 365 Reasons to Write. So it's sort of a book of daily inspiration. Oh. Works for everybody, not just for writers. So you can get the PDF of that if you get it your cell phone and text Get It Done Book, no spaces, mm-hmm. just Get It Done Book, all one word, to 96000. 96000. Get It Done Book. Get It Done Book. Text and, that. Right. And it'll text you back saying, hey, you're getting a text. And then it'll text you a little link to a web form and you give me your name and email address. You'll get the free PDF. And then you'll be on my mailing list. And, you know, there's a lot of kinds of fun stuff. You can tell me how your projects are going. I'd love to hear from you. You can unsubscribe anytime. I'll never sell your information. You're safe. <laughs> Absolutely. Ab- well, that's, that's always good to hear because uh, we're hearing a lot of uh, interesting stories about not being so safe on the Internet. Although I remember when the Internet first popped up and, and I was perusing back in the mid and late 90s and I kept being told over and over again, don't trust anything you read on the Internet because it's just all a bunch of goofballs up there. <laughs> well, thing time has not changed much. Nice. There are still a lot of goofballs, lot of goofballs, but there's a lot of good stuff up there, too. That's right. And it's a great time for artists. You can really get your work out there in a way that you've never had the freedom to do before. That website, one more time. TheOrganizedArtistCompany.com. TheOrganizedArtistCompany.com. The book is Get It Done, and it is for, I should say, from Procrastination to Creative Genius in 15 Minutes a Day. Sam Bennett's been my guest. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. I really enjoyed it, and thank you for coming in studio as well. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm Richard Dugan. This is Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Until next Saturday, love to love.